On August 15, 2021, the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan collapsed at the cost of $2.3 trillion and roughly 200,000 lives, the 20-year intervention ended in a humiliating defeat for the United States. Upon seeing the Taliban advance, Afghan troops surrendered, often without fighting. Meanwhile, President Ashraf Ghani fled Kabul mere days after stating he would rather die than leave. When the dust settled, the Taliban's victory was indisputable. For many, that is where the story ended, and following the invasion of Ukraine, press coverage dried up. But history does not cease when the cameras stop rolling. Since the Taliban's reconquest, Afghanistan has formed the eye of a brewing geopolitical storm. Economic disasters have wrought starvation, regional powers are pressing for influence, and Central Asia has been flooded with illicit goods. Nearly one year on, it is high time to ask what happened to Afghanistan and what does its future look like? Today's video is sponsored by Established Titles, which allows you to buy 1 to 10 square feet of land in Eddleston, Scotland. This plot of land just south of Edinburgh, I own that. Now technically that makes me a lord. You see, according to historic Scottish custom, landowners are referred to as lords or ladies. And since I have a small square feet of Scotland, that makes me Lord Shirvan. But perhaps the coolest part of this is that for every order, established titles teams up with international charities like One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to plant trees to help protect the woodlands of Scotland and places all over the world. It's just a fun and novel way of supporting global afforestation. Established titles will send you a proclamation with a crest so you get to call yourself a lord or lady and more importantly, you help in afforestation. This is not only neat, but it also makes an amazing last minute gift. Established Titles is actually running a Labor Day sale. Plus, if you use the code CASPIAN10, you get an additional 10% off. Go to establishedtitles.com slash CASPIAN10 to get your gifts now and help support the channel. The first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot within a few minutes of walking. Depending on how many of you want to become a lord or a lady, we can build our little kingdom. By the time Kabul fell to the Taliban, the Afghan state had rotted from within. Factionalism, over-centralization and corruption undermined the government's legitimacy. While, in the short term, drought and COVID-19 crippled the country's food security and healthcare capabilities. A situation exacerbated by the Taliban's summer offensive, which had internally displaced more than 3 million people. The Taliban thus inherited a state beset with problems. Even worse, Washington's nation-building had constructed a state dependent on foreign aid. International donors financed over half of Kabul's $6 billion state budget and four-fifths of its social spending. Upon the takeover, this support was pulled overnight. The only potential respite was to draw on the central bank's cash reserves, which had grown to nearly $10 billion during the occupation. Yet this presented a problem. Of these funds, 70% were and still are held at the Federal Reserve Building in downtown New York. Since 2002, Washington's designation of the Taliban as a global terrorist group has barred it from America's banking system and anyone who transacts with it. Given the United States is the global financial hub, such measures are akin to an economic death sentence. Thus, once the Taliban assumed control, international trade halted as the risk of secondary sanctions deterred commercial entities. Another devastating blow came in February 2022. Due to a potential civil claim by 9-11 victims and insurance companies, Biden issued an executive order freezing all Afghan central bank assets on American soil. Half of the $7 billion would be set aside for the potential claim. The other half would be held in trust for the Afghan people. 
And even though Washington has stated it will release the funds, Biden's decision is unusual for many reasons. In particular, the connection between the claimants and the central bank is unclear, as there are degrees of separation between them. First, it was Al-Qaeda that committed the 9-11 attacks and the Taliban's complicity is yet to be established. Second, the Afghan central bank is independent from both the state apparatus and the Taliban. And third, the money deposited in the bank belongs to ordinary Afghans who were friendly to the old non-Taliban government. So in essence, the 9-11 victims are suing ordinary citizens for their loss. Still worse, freezing bank assets has deprived the Afghan economy of nearly all liquidity. The economy is at a standstill, the Afghani currency has collapsed, workers and teachers go unpaid, and inflation has accelerated. According to the UN, 97% of Afghans will be impoverished by the end of 2022. While, according to the IMF, the Afghan GDP will contract by one-third a crash worse than the Great Depression. Combined with a global wheat shortage, 23 million Afghans are now at risk of starvation. Foreign aid has softened these effects, but without a functioning economy, the threat of famine remains constant. Over time, Washington's policy could backfire. While many blame the Taliban for Afghanistan's backslide, citizens of sanctioned nations tend to blame the sanctioner, not their own government. The UN Security Council's comprehensive sanctions on Iraq in the 1990s caused thousands of famine deaths, especially among children. Those who survived were often radicalized against the West, joining jihadist groups like ISIS. Similar developments are possible in Afghanistan. For instance, in June 2022, earthquakes killed around 1,100 Afghans. Relatives living abroad could not send aid back home due to sanctions. This despair has driven a rapid uptick in opioid addiction among Afghans. And such events could eventually drive the impoverished to take up arms. Meanwhile, Afghanistan's neighbors have their own concerns. Though the Taliban has attempted to project a more moderate image internationally, its extremist convictions are undeniable. In addition to repression of women and extrajudicial killings, Kabul recently published a manifesto pledging itself to theocratic governance. Even so, moving forward, the neighborhood's long-term interests are best served by diplomatic recognition and cooperation. For Pakistan, the relationship is complex. Though Islamabad helped the Taliban, the group's Pashtun makeup has long been a source of tension. The Durant Line, a 2600km border drawn by the British Empire through Pashtun communities, is rejected by the Taliban. Earlier this year, after the group attacked Pakistani nationals constructing a border fence, Islamabad retaliated with airstrikes, killing 50 Taliban and their Pakistani associates. Much will depend on the future of the deposed former Prime Minister Imran Khan. As a leader, Khan sought conciliation with the Taliban, congratulating them on battlefield victories and inviting them to join the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. The government that replaced him has taken a harder line, as evidenced by the heavy-handed border policy. Nevertheless, Imran Khan's recent successes in regional elections suggest he may be poised for a political comeback. Should he return to office, a diplomatic reset could be on the cards. Either way, the Pakistan-Taliban honeymoon is over, and diplomatic negotiation will set the terms for political affairs. For its part, China has softened its line towards Kabul. Beijing initially feared a Taliban resurgence could fuel Islamic separatism in neighboring Xinjiang. But after securing Taliban cooperation on border security, its fears have eased. Since then, China has increased aid to Afghanistan in an attempt to court Kabul. Mineral exploitation is an especially enticing prospect, and negotiations are currently ongoing between Chinese state-owned mining enterprises and the Taliban. Meanwhile, Russia is also edging towards recognition, and its Central Asian partners are generally on board. 
The main holdout is Tajikistan, due to reservations over border security and the treatment of Afghan Tajiks. Dushanbe has also sought cooperation with Washington in border security and sheltering Afghan exiles. Thus, Central Asia's Afghanistan policy is still far from settled. But the oddest reapproachment is perhaps that of Iran, where mutual antagonism towards Washington is a shared bond. The Taliban recently agreed to purchase 350,000 tons of oil from its neighbor. There are also signs that Shia Afghans have been promoted to official posts, which is a progressive step by the standards of a Sunni theocracy. Such measures are necessary to secure Tehran's support and cooperation. Meanwhile, Qatar is acting as Washington's eyes and ears. Doha now runs flights to Kabul and helps manage the airport. Through Qatar, Washington seeks to engage the Taliban's moderate elements. Currently though, the Haganey network, a semi-autonomous hardline bloc within the Taliban, holds sway in the country. So any truce between Washington and Kabul is still far off. But even without diplomatic recognition, international cooperation is needed to manage transnational issues. The dissolution of the Afghan security forces flooded Central Asia with illicit weapons worth an estimated $7 billion. Likewise, the Taliban claims it has secured more than 300,000 light arms, 26,000 heavy weapons and 61,000 military vehicles from their vanquished foes. However, poverty has forced many former Afghan troops to sell their service weapons on illicit markets. American-made gear and weapons are turning up in Kashmir, and Indian forces are concerned that these weapons will be turned against them by jihadists provoked by the Modi government's Hindu nationalist agenda. Meanwhile, the mining sector has also grown. Though slowing to a trickle during the Taliban's 2021 offensive, mineral extraction is accelerating. Indonesia's early 2022 ban on coal exports drove Pakistan to engage the Taliban, who were willing to sell minerals well below market price. Though Jakarta has since relaxed restrictions, international supply concerns are throwing Kabul an economic lifeline. Mining also holds implications for the country's internal power dynamics. Afghanistan boasts substantial reserves of copper, lithium and rare earth elements. Interior Minister Sirajuddin Haghani, leader of the powerful Haghani network, is looking to monopolize the mining sector to strengthen his influence within the Taliban. In Afghanistan, the mining industry is treated as a political football rather than an engine for economic development. The struggle for control gives way to factionalism, corruption and conflict. If Haghani appropriates the mining sector for himself, an inter-Taliban schism is likely. The resulting chaos would only deter potential investors from seeking a stable climate in which to invest. Handshake deals are insufficient when it comes to mining prospects and long-term fixed capital investments. What is needed is a state monopoly on violence and preferably an effective rule of law. Afghanistan has neither. For now, the supreme illicit trade remains the opium poppy, of which Afghanistan accounts for four-fifths of global production. Here, the Taliban's fundamentalist convictions have proven flexible. Despite previously banning the practice as an insurgency, the group tolerated and taxed poppy cultivation. And though Washington spent $8.5 billion to eradicate the trade, by 2017 farmers were recording bumper crops, accounting for around a third of the Afghan GDP. The thing is, since 2017, solar-powered pumps have allowed farmers to irrigate crops using underground aquifers, greening 220,000 hectares of desert in the process. This helped Afghans keep subsistence farms on the side. And though the Taliban has banned poppy cultivation in 2022, enforcement has been lax due to the country's economic woes. These factors could cement Afghanistan as a narco state. Accordingly, regional powers along the old Silk Road may seek to leverage their positions as a gateway to Europe. 
Iran and Turkey would gain a valuable bargaining chip with the West by either tightening or loosening counter-narcotics efforts, especially Turkey, which also has direct control over the Kabul airport. The opportunities for geopolitical brinkmanship could be as diverse as human errancy itself. All in all, the future of Afghanistan has not been written, but the first draft leaves a lot to be desired. Whether one likes it or not, the Taliban are not going anywhere, and this elementary fact must be acknowledged before any progress can occur. 40 years of conflict has devastated Afghanistan. And since people prefer the security of being the robber and not the robbed, institutionalized criminality will likely remain. Yet there are still choices. Washington could use its substantial leverage to extract reasonable concessions from the Taliban in exchange for releasing funds and humanitarian aid. Otherwise, the country risks falling into the abyss. Whatever happens, the circumstances leave the international community with a profound sense of unease. And yet, it's a situation that will essentially be tolerated. For when the starving go on hunger strike, few will notice. I've been your host Shivan from Caspian Report. Special thanks to Anton Murrell for helping in researching and writing this topic. And if you want to show some support, just leave a like, comment and share this video. Thank you for watching and Sarol.